So hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to this uh, conference, Philosophy and Generative Grammar. On behalf of my home institution, we welcome you uh, to the conference. My name is David Ray. Me and Rafael Gutierrez, the other organizer of this conference, I are pleased to have you all here. In case you don't have the conference program with you now, uh, you can find it in the link that Rafael is posting on the chat at the moment. Um, that being said, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor John Collins from the University of East Anglia. That the talk that he is giving today is titled Galilean Style in Generative Linguists. Um, I will share this screen now with the presentation. <clears throat> Great. <clears throat> Could everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, actually, David, could you put me on the outline? Uh, sorry, next slide. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, um, as I'm sure many of you are uh, aware, uh, Chomsky in particular, and many people after Chomsky, have uh, described uh, generative linguistics as um, aiming for, or indeed perhaps realizing um, what Chomsky refers to as a Galilean style in terms of its theorizing and uh, explanation. And uh, because um, I've recently been teaching um, um, uh, Galileo in a, in a kind of modern philosophy, uh, module. I thought it'd be nice to say something about this notion of a Galilean uh, style. <clears throat> so the paper really is kind of divided into two. Um, the first half, uh, I'll just say something about what on earth um, a Galilean style uh, amounts to. And as we'll see, it turns out to be uh, slightly more complicated uh, than um, we may have first uh, think, or at least it's more complicated, I think, <clears throat> than the way Chomsky um, uh, presents it. And then after that, I'll say something about <clears throat> uh, linguistics more uh, centrally um, in terms of, and how might it be uh, that linguistics has a Galilean uh, style. <clears throat> and again, the um, conclusion here will be, it's somewhat more complicated. <laughs> so. The talk is um, mainly um, 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 exegetical, I suppose, or even scholarly, uh, although, you know, I don't have pretensions to be a scholar. Um, but obviously in the q and I'm more than happy to um, address any issues that arise. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'll just kind of get onto it. Um, so next slide, David, please. Yeah, so uh, Chomsky first appeals to his notion of a Galilean style uh, via uh, Steve Weinberg, the um, famous physicist who can recently died. And in uh, Rules and Representations, uh, Chomsky quotes Weinberg as saying this, uh, the Galilean style amounts to making abstract mathematical models of the universe uh, to which at least the physicists give a higher degree of reality than they accord the ordinary world of uh, sensation. Um, and Chomsky also in that book, um, Will's Representation from 1980, uh, references Cl um, sorry, Clavelin. And what Clavelin uh, stresses in his book is what he calls this notion of a kind of new standard of scientific intelligibility, uh, which comes with Galileo. And here Galileo is said to uh, prioritize uh, constants mathematically expressed uh, over, the, over um, observational phenomena, or these over coverage um, of data. So this is what's uh, supposed to be new with Galileo uh, at the beginning of the uh, 17th uh, century. And Chomsky's quoting these people 
as in effect uh, saying, uh, look, uh, this is how science uh, should be, at least post um, Galileo and generative linguistics is really just following the uh, path of a science. <clears throat> and this, these remarks take place in the context where um, Chomsky is uh, uh, responding mainly to philosophers and others who are questioning the, um, um, if you like, the kind of philosophical uh, foundations of generative linguistics. And the idea is saying, look, the foundations are fine, or at least the theoretical orientation is fine, because we're just adopting the Galilean style. Uh, this is perfectly accepted in the physical realm. All we're doing now is just applying it to the linguistic realm. That's the kind of idea. So uh, next slide, David, please. Yeah. Um, later on, <coughs> Chomsky elaborates. He says, uh, <coughs> what was striking about Galileo was that he dismissed a lot of data. Uh, the Galilean style is a recognition that it is the abstract systems you are constructing that are really the truth. Uh, the array of phenomena is some distortion due to many factors. And so it makes sense to disregard phenomena and search for principles that really seem to give some deep insight into why some of them um, are that way recognizing that there are others we can't pay attention to. So again, there's something essentially kind of uh, selective, if you like, um, about this Galilean uh, style. And th this, Chomsky says this in a, um, 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 in a um, interview. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> from both what Weinberg says, which Chomsky apparently endorses, and then Chomsky's later remark about the Galilean style involving ignoring data. Uh, this suggests a certain tradition in um, uh, Galileo scholarship. And so um, uh, Alexander Corre, um, in his work on Galileo, uh, characterized him um, effectively as a Platonist. Uh, there's this famous quote from Galileo, which I'll get to, where Galileo is speaking of um, circles and squares and straight lines, and it's this that's 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 what's really real. Uh, and so, kind of, Corey takes this uh, seriously, as as in a sense being an espousal of Platonism uh, against the prevailing Aristotelianism, right, which obviously went through the medieval period. Um, um, and was still the main kind of philosophical orientation at the beginning of the uh, 17th century. He also suggests um, the kind of view you find in um, Paul Farabin um, against method, where Farabin here is not, see, is not endorsing the view, but rather criticizing it, basically saying, look, the what happens in the Galilean style is that you basically ignore lots and lots of evidence. So, so he, this is, as I said, is intended to be something of an objection to, to the Galileo. At least an objection if one has the view <coughs> that um, uh, Galileo's various theories um, empirically outperformed the um, um, uh, competing theories. Um, I think, though, uh, uh, Chomsky's point doesn't, oh, it may well echo uh, these, these ideas. I don't think that's what he's really up to. I think it's the basic simple thought here is just that the theoretical focus of Galileo and, and then generative linguistics, as, as uh, he wants to um, propound it, uh, is on a, something like an underlying system at the expense of uh, data. So if you like, the job here of science post-Galileo is not data coverage, but rather something like explanation. And this style of explanation uh, involves, if you like, a lack of data coverage, right? So you're not going to be able to have your cake and eat it. Right? <clears throat> you're not going to be able to have the deep 
beautiful explanations you want, as well as coverage of data. So here's a very um, uh, easy way of uh, a few simple examples. So <clears throat> if you just think very broadly of something like the competence performance distinction, as soon as you make that distinction, what you're basically doing is treating as, if you like, irrelevant to, the, to one's theoretical ambitions, uh, much of performance. Uh, things like, you know, false starts, all kinds of errors and so on and so forth that are occurring uh, performance. Uh, also, the idea of a theory is to, if you like, capture certain counterfactuals, even if these are not sort of witnessed in the data um, at all, right? They're counterfactuals, right? So if you just think of the, the uh, standard idea that you want to a grammar um, <clears throat> uh, to have an infinite output, or at least to you know to generate um, denumerably many uh, structures. Uh, again, the, the the point you could think of that, and I'll return to this point, is just the thought that it's irrelevant that um, a lot of these structures will uh, uh, can't apply to anything that's kind of witnessed in uh, performance. But in some <coughs> uh, broad sense, <coughs> uh, it needs to capture uh, um, an array of counterfactuals. You know, in, in the same way as you might think, um, Newton's theory of say gravity will explain what will happen to the moon if the earth just pops out of existence. Obviously, right, the Earth isn't going to pop out of existence, and we don't assume it will. But nevertheless, <coughs> uh, we want a theory to account uh, for that kind of um, of uh, phenomena should it occur. Um, there's also uh, the sense in which uh, we take a theory to uh, accept uh, potentially deep insights even if they cause problems in data coverage. So an example of this, for instance, is this idea, which is very common, that you should have a uniform binary branching, right? So all uh, syntactic structure is uh, binary. Now, on the face of it, <laughs> that causes some kind of problems for uh, data coverage, right? Because you, you've got uh, all kinds of uh, uh, phenomena on the face of it which don't uh, exhibit uh, binary branching. Uh, so, uh, you know, why then go for kind of binary branching? Uh, or why as we insist uh, on, on, on this? Um, and again, the one thought here is, <clears throat> well, you do that because it makes the, it makes the system uh, most simple or kind of most elegant. And then you have to account for, and then as well, you account for whatever phenomena there are in terms of this most, most simple or elegant um, uh, system. I should say, of course, I mean, ideally, then going down this route would actually offer some kind of unique, uh, so would offer some kind of insight which you're not going to have um, um, uh, um, otherwise. And so, I mean, I can talk about this in the Q&A, but if you take something like double object constructions, um, on the face of it, they lock as if they're kind of ternary branching in some way, and they used to be treated that way, but then treating them as binary actually manages to explain some, some, some features of a double object construction. So anyway, that's the sort of idea. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, there's an irony <clears throat> um, in this notion of a Galilean style, because uh, the, the actual term Galilean style uh, was coined by um, um, Edmund Husserl in his uh, 1936 work, um, uh, Crisis of European Science, <clears throat> and, and he actually meant Galilean style. Uh, to be uh, in some sense problematic 
and his idea of crisis here was that what happened with Galileo is that you have this kind of cleavage between the world as we experience it and the world um, that uh, science um, um, presents us as inhabiting. And he thinks then of this kind of crisis as then characterized in the kind of modern uh, period. I should say, I, mean, I, I the, part of Husserl's shtick here is the idea that uh, Galileo is depending upon geometry, but then geometry itself is dependent upon experience, right? And Galileo is, um, a, as we're sort of, a, a, in some sense, issuing uh, experience. And I think that's a bit silly, because, um, as I said at the bottom, the, the style, if you like, uh, remained intact, even though you had these developments very quickly in, certainly in terms of analytical geometry and the calculus. Within That should be the 17th century, not the 19th century, uh, where even if you thought that geometry or the relevant mathematics was dependent upon experience, by the time you hit the end of the 17th century, the mathematics had kind of developed in such a way as to shed uh, any any kind of uh, uh, commitment to so intuitive uh, conception of um, geometry. Anyway, that's just really an, um, an aside. So uh, next slide, please. So what does the style amount to then? And here's me rather, rather than Chomsky. Um, <clears throat> I think you could think of it as just in these terms. You treat uh, observable events as basically complexes, which you then seek to um, uh, decompose. Um, and an essential part of this decomposition is the identification, or at least the sort of postulation, of a sort of mathematically specifiable sort of lawful phenomena, uh, along with, if you like, local uh, contingencies. And then what you then seek to do is to, as we're kind of uh, recapture the initial phenomena, or you kind of reconstruct the initial phenomena uh, as, as a kind of interaction effect. Right. On the one hand, you've got uh, something that's uh, mathematically specifiable or purely formal, and you've got as well sort of local contingencies. Right. Uh, the, the way, I mean, this is just an historical aside, uh, I think the way of understanding what Galileo is up to here is that, as I put it here, he kind of renders the sublunary as superlunary. Right. So that's to say, on the standardized Tyrian picture, uh, <clears throat> things beyond the moon, or at least the heavenly bodies and the sun and then beyond the sun, uh, are in a sense of perfect and um, 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 unchanging, you know, everything moves in circles and the circles are perfect and so on and so forth, whereas everything on earth is kind of messy and um, uh, contingent. In a sense, Galileo is kind of dissolving that distinction between the sublunary and the superlunary by, in a way, making the sublunary superlunary, as opposed to the other way. Uh, but that's, as I said, just a kind of uh, uh, historical aside. At any rate, um, I think what's central to the Galilean style is, if you like, a focus on explanation, not on uh, not on metaphysics. So uh, unlike, say, what um, someone like Alexander Colley uh, reckons. Um, next slide, please. <coughs> yeah, so here's just some uh, quotes to get you into the idea. Uh, this is from the Assayer. So Galileo says, uh, philosophy is written in this grand book, uh, the universe, which stands continually open to our gaze but the book cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language, read the letters in which it is composed. It is written in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles, circles and other geometric figures without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of it. Without these, one wanders about in the dark 
logarithms. So mathematics uh, is essential to um, um, uh, explanation. It's as well the the the, <coughs> the language um, uh, of the uh, bulk of the universe, uh, but it's also kind of hidden from us. Uh, so next uh, slide, please. Yeah. So here's from uh, the two world systems. Uh, he says, um, which is then this quote is very interesting if you think about. So from the first quote, it can seem as if Galileo is a kind of Platonist, as if what's really real is something uh, abstract. Whereas this, I think, gives you a more nuanced uh, view of what's going on. He says, uh, it would be novel indeed if computations and ratios made in abstract numbers should not thereafter correspond to concrete gold and silver coins and merchandise. Just as a computer who wants his calculations to deal with sugar, silk and wool must discount the boxes, bales and other packings, so the mathematical scientist when he wants to recognize in the concrete the effects which he has proved in the abstract, must deduct the material hindrances. And if he is able to do so, I assure you that things are in no less agreement than arithmetical computations. The errors then lie not in the abstractness or concreteness, not in geometry or physics, but in a calculator who does not know how to make a true accounting. Hence, if you had a perfect sphere and a perfect plane, even though they were material, you would have no doubt that they touched in one point. <clears throat> so I think what's going on here is, again, this idea of the, the abstractness of the mathematical as, as, as being uh, at one or coeval with or a part of or an aspect of um, the, one, the, the one reality. <clears throat> what you must do if you're the clever uh, computer or scientist is to know what to leave out, as it were, right? <clears throat> so if, in this case, you don't pay attention to the packing, as it were, you, you just think of, uh, uh, what, you, you, you're able to uh, identify things in such a way that you can deal with them uh, in terms of numbers. That's the, that's the idea. So I think this this kind of quote really goes against uh, any kind of uh, Platonist uh, reading of um, of uh, Galileo. Uh, as we'll see, these issues play out in linguistics. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is from the two new sciences, uh, Galileo's last work. He says uh, of these properties, uh, accidenti of weight, of velocity, and also of form, infinite in number, it is not possible to give an exact description. Hence, in order to handle this matter in a scientific way, it is necessary to cut loose from these difficulties. And having discovered and demonstrated the theorems in the case of no resistance, to use them and apply them without such limitations as experience will teach. So again, the uh, point here is how you uh, think of all these uh, observable um, properties like weight, velocity, form, etc. These infinite in number, they're variable. You need to, um, in some sense, uh, abstract away from these kinds of properties in order to think about um, a certain kind of uh, idealized case and then use that case to. Um, um, understand uh, the phenomena that's presented as always having a weight or a velocity of a particular form. Um, next slide, please. Oh, we'll see if it's pans out. Um, so, what I want to say is that a Galilean style is not a metaphysical uh, position. Uh, and so, even though um, it Certainly, Galileo certainly inspired a kind of research of 
um, mechanical philosophy that was kind of prevailing over uh, traditional uh, Aristotelianism in the 17th century. Um, I think Galileo's view is far more expansive than that. And what he's after is, is with this new standard of intelligibility or a new standard of explanation. <clears throat> and I think in that respect, uh, he's been uh, uh, successful. And so just if you look at, say, um, someone like Langer's work on the history of materialism or Einstein and Infeld later on in the 1930s, the thing both of them stress is as well the, the, the way in which um, kind of materialism as understood in the 17th century uh, was a certain kind of metaphysical sort of view that it turns out that one can discard while still doing as well as sort of proper science. Uh, and, and I think this that view, in effect, in effect, is already there, kind of right at the beginning with um, with uh, Galileo. So I don't think there's anything within the style, within the Galilean style, that presupposes the the kind of materialism uh, that was uh, developing uh, in the 17th century. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so I'll just be quick on this. So here's a simple kind of example. So the little formula there is a formula for the, for the pendulum. And, and the thing to note here is that, so the period of the pendulum, it swing back and forth, uh, doesn't depend upon, uh, um, <clears throat> so, um, it doesn't depend upon the weight um, of the bob, like the ball at, at, at the end of the rod of the pendulum, uh, the material it's made of, and so on and so forth. The only thing it depends upon is the length of the rod, right? Uh, so in effect, and I mean, G there is, 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 is a gravity. Obviously Galileo didn't appeal to gravity, but you know, basically free fall, right? Uh, so the um, the point here, though, is that this little equation <clears throat> doesn't, if you like, uh, describe, in a sense, it can't possibly describe an actual pendulum. Because an actual pendulum uh, will have a rod um, of a certain kind of material, and will have a certain kind of mass, and then obviously the size of the bob or the mass of the bob will affect the rod, right? So any pendulum you kind of come across will depart from your uh, simple little equation there. Uh, but nevertheless, the idea is that this equation is giving you a sort of deep insight into the nature um, of a pendulum, even though it doesn't actually as well, capture in itself um, uh, or describe in itself any uh, actual, real, as, as well as or actual or uh, observable um, pendulum. You use the equation uh, <clears throat> along with local contingencies and you factor in those uh, contingencies in order to understand the actual uh, performance of a uh, given pendulum. So if you wanted to synchronize pendulums, you would look at the length of, 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 of the rod. Right? You wouldn't bother about the mass, et cetera, right? Even though the mass of the, the bob is always going to affect uh, the behavior of an actual pendulum. And <coughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, so next slide, please. Yeah, uh, the, the same principle applies or same ideas apply to so Galileo's discovery of free fall, inertia, and parabolic motion, etc. But I, I won't, uh, I'll uh, put them to one side. But if people want to discuss any, any of these, I'm happy to do so. Um, next slide then, please. <coughs> so, how does this apply to linguistics? Well, <coughs> Here's Chomsky at the beginning of the famous opening chapter of um, Aspects from 1965. 
where he doesn't talk about Galileo, as I mentioned earlier, the first time Chomsky is talking about Galileo is basically uh, from Stephen Weinberg in the mid 70s. Uh, whereas I think if you go back and look at aspects, what's going on in aspects, <clears throat> I think you can see this Galilean style there, even though Chomsky doesn't mention Galileo. So he says, uh, linguistic theory is concerned primarily with an ideal speaker listener in a completely homogenous speech community who knows its language perfectly and is unaffected by such grammatically irrelevant conditions as memory limitations, distractions, shifts of attention, and interest in errors, random or characteristic. So like characteristic, maybe something like um, agreement, attraction, and random would just be you know, some kind of um, uh, drunken speech. <laughs> uh, and applying his knowledge of the language and actual performance. To study actual linguistic performance, we must consider the interaction of a variety of factors, of which the underlying competence of the speaker here is only one. In this respect, study of language is no different from empirical investigation of other complex phenomena. So here you might be thinking, <coughs> you're, you're idealizing to an um, ideal, to, <coughs> to a speaker listener who's unaffected uh, by uh, a whole range of conditions, and you're postulating a, uh, a competence that um, uh, is inviolate, or at least uh, has various properties, independent of those um, other non-linguistic uh, factors. And then what you find in performance is the interaction of the two. So this would be competency would be like the pendulum <laughs> and actual pendulums and how they behave, you're gonna have to re you're gonna have to introduce other uh, uh, factors. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so first clarification is Chomsky doesn't propose to study the ideal speaker listener to, uh, as I say here, some form of kind of metaphysical prejudice, but simply because positing such a speaker listener is a way of isolating an invariant phenomenon from general factors that variably contribute to actual use of language. So the point there has been that and these, these factors um, are, as we're perfectly general, they don't have a particular reference to language. Uh, and so methodologically, at least, the hope would be we can put these to one side, as I said, much as Galileo was suggesting that we can uh, put to one side um, um, the um, an infinite number of uh, accidenti, as he calls them, uh, that affect uh, motion. Uh, so um, next slide, please. Um, so secondly, Chomsky is not suggesting that performance, as he calls it, is to be, if you like, forgotten about. You know, in the same way as if Galileo were, was suggesting you can forget about actual, actual um, pendulums. Uh, to the contrary, an adequate theory of performance will view it as an interaction effect. None of this is prejudice, but as I said, a kind of Galilean orientation. Right? But here's to the first point really I wish to stress, there is a disanalogy which might, makes the kind of Galilean uh, epithet uh, misleading. Um, so next slide, please. Right, so a pendulum viewed as having a period subject to the length of a massless rod and gravity alone um, is ideal, right? Much as the ideal speaker listener is. Um, but also, uh, Galileo was offering an account of actual pendulum. Right? If one could have had a sort of massless rod and a vacuum, the period of a pendulum would be precisely described by the equation, right? I mean, at least without further ado. Right. So it's as if here for Galileo, what you're talking about when you 
think about the ideal case is in a sense something that could or at least you're envisaging it uh, as if it could be uh, kind of realized it, it's worthwhile noting here that the notion of a vacuum which we're obviously very familiar with now uh, was highly contentious at the time Galileo was uh, writing so when Galileo describes um, gravity is operating in a vacuum, right? So the rate of free fall is in fall in a vacuum. And that in the 17th century is a very, as a well, strange thing to say, because many people at the time, including Descartes and others, Hobbes, thought there was no vacuum. Not only was it there a vacuum, it was impossible, right? It was as well, sort of virtually incoherent that there should be a vacuum, right? But, but that uh, view doesn't affect Galileo's kind of procedure, right? It wasn't that Galileo was, as it were, fully committed to there being a vacuum. It kind of doesn't make a difference right, to, to his view. Um, but then by parity reasoning, Chomsky should be, if he's following Galileo, as it were, should be offering a theory of a speaker hero. As if he's saying, under ideal conditions, the theory would explain the actions of the subject, right? Just as Galileo's equations capture the movements of the ideal uh, pendulum, right? So as to say, competence would be competent, competence to produce and, and consume linguistic material, albeit under ideal conditions. And this is kind of exactly the way uh, Michael Devitt reads the notion of competence. Competence is a kind of idealized way of, is an idealized performance. Right? And if you were to manage to realize the ideal, then the grammar, which is posited as a, as a competence theory, would turn into or would amount to a uh, performance theory. This always, he always, he always <laughs> I've been arguing with Michael about this for many years. And initially I was just thinking, what on earth is he talking about? I mean, why, why on earth should he think this? And he only occurred to me really from thinking about Galileo as a kind of explanation of why he should think what he thinks. But anyway, uh, next slide, please. But here's the kind of problem. Uh, Chomsky is clear that a generative grammar is not a model for a speaker hero, right? Not on the face of it, even an ideal one, right? So the point could be put like this, uh, with a pendulum, if we abstract the ideal, we still have a pendulum, right? Just as if we abstract to a vacuum, we still have motion, right? Even if, right, there is no vacuum, right? Because at at the beginning of the 17th century, nobody knew if there was a vacuum or not, right? It was only much later that uh, proof of or something like a vacuum was established. Um, but with the speaker here, if we abstract to just the generative grammar, we don't have a speaker here at all on the face of it. Right. Uh, which I'll get to. So next slide, please. So the crucial difference uh, is, I think, due to the, the difference between the respective uh, explanander, right, between, say, Galileo and linguistics. So Galileo's concern <coughs> is basically for kinematics, right, so motion and interaction in space, regardless of the internal constitution of the objects. You know, and, and you find this going through to, to Newton as well, right, where, He's just thinking of objects as just point masses. Uh, Chomsky is concerned with internal states, right? So the production consumption profile of, if you like, Chomsky's ideal speaker listener is just isn't the target of the theory. Right? Rather, such an ideal agent would exhibit a profile that would provide a clear view of what the generative grammar the actual target of the theory contributes to performance. Right? <clears throat> so in this sense, performance is essentially, if 
find of refractors that fall outside of the purview of the grammar, right? Even under ideal conditions. Right? So it's <clears throat> the theory is not, uh, in a sense, right, a performance theory, not even an idealized uh, performance theory, because it's concerned with, if you like, uh, internal states independent of um, uh, performance. In a way, you don't, you just don't have that kind of distinction uh, when you're, say, thinking of a case of someone like Galileo. <clears throat> um, and therefore, there's this fundamental kind of disanalogy. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, since so here's the way to bring some of these issues out. So, if you think about sensor and then inks. I'll just assume everybody knows these. Um, so we've got one here, sailors, 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 fight, fight, fight. Um, now, from a usage perspective, one might think that one is simply not part of the language at all. Right? It's just kind of ungrammatical. Um, well, if, if so, then whatever procedure generates relative clauses uh, must be bounded. Right? So as to say, all, all you've got here is in the relative clause embedded in the relative clause. And if that's out, right, if you can't do that, then that's just telling you, okay, whatever generates relative clauses has to have some kind of bound on it. Where does that come from? Well, presumably some general factors or experience. Yeah? And this is the kind of view you find uh, Christensen and McDonald arguing uh, for. Right? I think there's such an inference is uh, erroneous. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, if you just think about it, uh, the sort of simplest specification of a recursive procedure, um, then it's uh, unbounded. Right? And so it is with uh, relative clauses. Right? So the, the syntax of relative clauses here is obviously as controversial as any other, but just assume, just for the sake of argument, that you've got something like these old kind of rewrite rules. So you say a, a, noun, a noun phrase can be rewritten as a noun with a relative clause attached, and a relative clause can have some kind of noun phrase and a uh, verb phrase. Right? Um, now, what this basically um, uh, allows one to do is to then uh, uh, embed um, a relative clause within a relative clause. Um, but then if unacceptability like kicks in at a certain point, right, on let's say the third kind of iteration, I'll say the, the data is somewhat more complicated than I'm suggesting here, but anyway, just imagine that there's some, there's some <coughs> unacceptability occurs as well, somewhere, right? Uh, then if we were to posit a bound on relative clause formation, that's to say, if we were to include within our grammar something that says you, you can only do this so many times, uh, then such a bound would, as I put it here, vacuously feature in the very rules that generate the acceptable cases, right? and would never and would never apply unless a speaker finds herself studying linguistics, right? So it's the idea of saying you, you you've got this <coughs> uh, grammar whose rule includes some kind of bound, uh, which never has kind of application. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, if we are to posit a bound, it would be most sensible not to have it affect the procedure, right? That, as it were, pays no heed to such a bound, right? But to have it as a kind of factor, as some factor that constrains the application of, of the procedure, right? And that's precisely Chomsky's claim, right? However, we have to theorize the boundedness of central embedding, it does not affect the basic linguistic principles, which 
quite recursive, are going to be uh, unbounded. Uh, as I said, the split here isn't kind of noticed uh, because the data is nigh on always bounded. Right? So it's where the, the, the data is giving you kind of one view, whereas the rules are kind of giving you another more, more sorts of general view. Right? So uh, <coughs> the, um, the data is just a kind of snapshot of what the rules allow for. Uh, one way of thinking of this, as I say here is that you can't acquire the recursive procedure in a kind of stepwise fashion, right? So one way of thinking of this is just this way. You say, you know, because any bound on the depth of the application of the procedure um, that is to be kind of removed or extended will be equivalent to the recursive rule plus that condition, right? So be actually, so that would actually be more complex than the simple recursive rule kind of by itself. Right. That's the idea. <clears throat> um, uh, next slide, please. Um, now, you can't follow Christiansen and MacDonald and think, look, well, what if there's no rules? Uh, and they say you learn recursivity from the data. Right? <clears throat> um, and they say, so. Uh, it breaks down when the data goes beyond the uh, learned uh, limits. Right. So that's where you, you kind of learn <clears throat> um, how far you can embed or what depth you, you can embed basically from your uh, experience with the uh, language. And, and the rules you have, in, as far as you want to speak of them as rules, just reflects those limits in the uh, primary linguistic data. Now, I think it's clear that so how recursivity shows itself in a particular language uh, must be acquired from data, right? So standard case of it, Saxon genitive allows embedding, Bill's friend's dog, etc. right? But we don't have that kind of construction in, say, Spanish, right? So it's called the Saxon genitive. Um, so this difference, uh, though, pertains to, if you like, where recursivity shows up in the language, right? Not whether recursivity as such is learned from and reflects the limitations of the data, right? And on the face of it, it no uh, uh, <coughs> recursive principle, or at least no recursive kinds of structures you find, uh, appears to uh, reflect uh, limitations of the data. Um, next slide, I'll explain. So the first reason for this is just that one, so one remember is a sailor, sailor, sailors, fight, fight, fight. Uh, they're not gibberish, right? He has a precise interpretation, right, which can be easily explained and which follows from a kind of interpretation acceptable relative clauses uh, possess. Right? So it might be thought that this level of understanding is due to some form of, say, analogical reasoning. But it is only the sort of usage presumption that would lead one to think it analogical, right? as opposed to an exercise of linguistic competence, albeit in an unusually laborious way. Right? So, I mean, the, the simple fact here, I think, is that no extra, so no, so extra linguistic information need uh, needs to be brought to bear to understand the kind of center embedding cases. Right? Uh, it, it's just for some reason, it's hard to process these um, um, sentences, which I'll get to. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so a second reason is uh, if recursivity is learned from data limited to non-center embedding in relative clause formation, then one should expect recursivity to be similarly limited in other cases where the data is relevantly limited, um, right? So if boundedness of recursion follows from a character of the data, then equivalent boundedness should be found wherever the data is relevantly limited, yeah? The <coughs> bound should just be as well reflected in the uh, language you're, you're likely to come across. But that doesn't appear to be the case at all. 
Um, next slide, which I'll explain. So things like the boy behind the girl, behind the man, behind the dog is blonde. One is a predecessor of two, which is a predecessor of three, which is a predecessor, and so on, right? Uh, Bill's sister's friend's dog's dinner. So in all of these kinds of, uh, oh, sorry, next slide. Sorry if you remember these kinds of cases, which are very familiar anyway. Um, oh, sorry, next slide, David, please. All right, so the thing to note about all of these um, is that uh, these kinds of constructions are not used up to whatever limit our understanding packs up. So at a certain point, we kind of lose track right, of, of these things, right? But they're not used up to, as well, as well. <clears throat> we don't find these kinds of uh, constructions used up to the point at which our understanding packs up. So if we consider it in these cases, we'll learn from the data, then we should expect the limits of our understanding to be aligned with the constructions of columns, right? But it's not. Um, and the multiple embeddings of all kinds are actually uncommon in the primary linguistic data. Right? Uh, it's also, there's emphasis that children show sensitivity to embedded clauses and in terms of non local dependencies. Um, so again, this indicates that children are not using data to determine the possibility of embedding, but able to interpret embedding when it arises, right? which is exactly as, as you would uh, expect on the sort of standard generative model. Uh, next slide, please. So what accounts then for the unacceptability of uh, central embeddings. So the, the standard view is that there's something extra linguistic that's uh, going on. <clears throat> so just to advertise an idea from uh, Jana Foda. Um, so next slide, please. So Jana, I'll skip through this because I'm sensitive to time. So Jana Foda's view is basically, uh, the problem with central embeddings is to do with prosody, right? not to do with working memory. Um, I, I, I was teaching um, some of this stuff and then it occurred to me, I said almost offhand uh, to a class, look, the problem is that you can't even say uh, the uh, central embedding cases. And then they occurred to me, oh, that's, that's kind of funny. So I um, spoke to Jennifer Ford about this and she said, oh yeah, yeah, that's music to my ears. <laughs> but anyway, so <clears throat> you can get a sense of this from what's called the pronoun effect, where center embeddings become easier um, uh, if you have a sort of pronoun, right? basically a kind of reduction of a morphological load, right? So the thought is that the, the rusty pipes, the plumber I hired, and try to fix, continue to leak occasionally. I mean, that, so 5B isn't nice, but it's kind of, you know, you, you can sort of get it. Whereas the pipes, the unlicensed plumber, the new janitor reluctantly assisted, try to repair by a burst is like awful. Right? So, <clears throat> oh. so um, the uh, view here, so my um, someone's just come in, but it's okay. She's very nice. <laughs> and the view here is that um, uh, John Foda's view is that um, if uh, you've got a balance of like these three chunks, three kind of prosodic chunks, uh, then um, comprehension should work uh, fine. Um, but, so the, the, the case here would be something like the rusty old ceiling pipes, the plumber mine damp frame fixed, continue to leak occasionally. And the idea is that this is uh, not so bad, right? And the reason it's not so bad is because of uh, positive, right? Not, um, so the thought then is that the problem with central embeddings arises 
uh, from this kind of interface of uh, prosody <coughs> and uh, syntax, but the two are as we're sort of independent um, um, and in independent systems. Right? Prosody is not recursive, it's not compositional, syntax is, so you're going to get this kind of mismatch, right? The stars are going to have to be aligned, as it were, uh, for you to be able to uh, process properly a, um, a central embedding case like six. And these just don't arise in the data. But when they do arise in the data, you can kind of uh, deal with them. Uh, next slide, please. So the bottom line here is that consumption and production makes uh, essential use of extra grammatical properties, such as prosodic structure, uh, that's simply far outside of the purview of the competence theory. Uh, we cannot abstract away from them and still be left with a model of consumption production, right? No more than it makes sense to think of consumption production without an external vehicle, right? Some kind of material sign, right? Um, so, this is just a long-winded way of saying <clears throat> competence is not idealized uh, consumption production because consumption production essentially involves uh, something that isn't, as it were, kind of linguistic, or at least something that's a different kind of system. It's an interaction effect. Um, so uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so, um, as I said, one way of uh, thinking of this then is a Galilean style, if it's adopted, or at least if we're thinking of the theory in these terms, uh, should then be understood not with respect to performance, but with respect to internal states. Um, next slide. <clears throat> um, so, I'll be quick with this. So, um, Here's a quote, the first quote, uh, it says, this is from Chomsky, of course, there are differences between linguistics and physics. The physicist is actually postulating physical entities and processes, so, uh, while we, we are keeping to abstract conditions that unknown mechanisms must meet. We might go on to suggest actual mechanisms, but we know that it would be pointless to do so in the present stage of our ignorance concerning the functioning of the brain. This, however, is not a relevant difference of principle. Um, so, and then the second quote essentially goes in the same line. So here you have the idea of a competence theory as being, a, being an abstraction, but it's not a kind of abstract object in a kind of platonic sense. It's rather uh, something that comes from adopting a particular kind of style of theorizing. It's as if you're saying there are certain phenomena which I'm only going to be able to understand by viewing them uh, in these abstract terms. In a way, then, that means <clears throat> I don't, uh, at the moment, at least given that stage of ignorance, need to think about what realizes uh, these um, as we're abstracter. Um, so, next slide, please. Yeah, so as I said, fundamental thought is a certain aspects in nature, here we're talking about cognition, are only tractable via a certain kind of theory or type of abstraction. So you could just think, well, what type of abstraction? Something like a generative grammar that issues in denumerably many hierarchically uh, organized structures in some way. So uh, in this slide, from the theorist perspective, the speaker here and realizes a computational system because a computational system is a perfect system to which, in the Galilean spirit, we abstract, right? Much as we view a pendulum as possessing a massless rod or an inclined plane as being frictionless. Right? <clears throat> That's the idea. Uh, so, as where well, this is not a kind of metaphysical commitment, but it's rather a reflection that comes from uh, adopting a certain kind of theory. Uh, next slide, I'm close to the end, I'm sorry. Um, so here's just to finish an objection. Um, so from 
you I say folder publishing, they there's not some unknown paper that they published together. This is just the kind of thing they would say <laughs> or have said. <clears throat> so like a comp the idea of computation imposes conditions that are not merely as well unknown, right? So you can't just appeal to ignorance and while still um uh, so, sorry, it's like <clears throat> if you adopt a computational perspective, you also take on board certain metaphysical presumptions. But, uh, so, like what? It says, well, the conditions must involve, say, physical symbols and local or mechanical transitions between them. Right? That's what computation kind of is. At least metaphysically, it must involve those things. Right? Um, now, it seems to me that this stance is precisely to decide, if you like, on the realization of a kind of Galilean system on this, on this abstraction in a way that's not kind of mandated by the abstraction itself, right? So, uh, viewing an orbital, say, curve as everywhere differentiatable, right, and that just follows from, from the kind of calculus, uh, is just a consequence of the mathematical theory, right? Yet yeah, nothing follows about how reality must be, right? Whether motion is infinitely divisible in some way, right? Independent of the theory. Right? I mean, you know, as if you could kind of metaphysically determine the kind of nature of whether motion is infinitely divisible independently of viewing it mathematically. Um, and in fact, uh, it's precisely the kind of unknown this, that idea of the unknown, right, that uh, Stephen Weinberg actually finishes his paper on, which Chomsky doesn't quote. So if you look at the Weinberg paper, he goes on to uh, sort of name check um, Eugene Wigner, uh, Wigner's famous puzzle about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, right? It's like, why on earth does this abstraction, so whether it is in mathematics or elsewhere, actually work? Right? If the world is recalcitrant and we don't know it, our abstractions are designed uh, with our intentions and purposes in mind, but nevertheless, there's this kind of sympathy or marriage between them that allows for this kind of deep explanation. Right? How on earth is that possible? So somehow formal theories manage to reflect underlying systems, and such theories are their keep by accounting for phenomena not by a confirmation that the underlying system is as the theory says, right? So no rod can be massless, just as real motion can cannot be divided into non denumerable many points, right? So I mean, if you're thinking of real motion as, as we're <coughs> real, <laughs> um, as, as something that's as we're material or something that's specifiable materially, then on the face of it, it's not gonna be divisible into as many points as there are on the number line, uh, on the real number line. Uh, all the action evolves upon what reasons we have to commend one theory over another with their respective Galilean content of abstract perfect systems. Right? There's no metaphysical route to determining which one is correct, and the models give us no information of how reality is anyway. So I think I'll end there given the time, but thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, okay, let's move to the Q&A. If, if you have questions for Jan, then raise your hand at the bottom that you have at the, the bottom of your screen. Since, since Jan didn't start on time, I propose that we add five extra minutes to this part of the session so that we end at 3.35 uh, London time. Um, I am not seeing hands for the moment. Maybe I'm not. I will stop the sharing for a second. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, David, please. You are mute. Sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the the talk, John. Um, Actually, my uh, understanding of Chomsky is greatly influenced by you and the book you wrote on Chomsky. So obviously, oh, I, yeah, yeah. So I found myself agreeing with uh, much of what you had to say. Uh, but um, there, there was a there was a point, and actually, it wasn't central 
thought what you wanted to say here. So maybe it's not the best first question to ask. It's more like a last question, but um, <laughs> uh, so you mentioned Husserl at one point. There. Oh yeah. Yeah. And you, you noted that actually he coined Galilean style and mm -hmm. uh, kind of diagnoses this as part of the crisis uh, yeah. of European sciences. Yeah. And part of the issue I take it is this sort of self forgetting, uh, the forgetting of experience. Of course, this is an idea that's been developed recently by people like Philip Goff, right? And oh. Galilee's error and uh, Evan Thompson uh, and yeah. so forth. Uh, it's, it's maybe perhaps a nice diagnosis for the problem of consciousness. Um, and of course the idea has been developed in similar ways by other figures like Sellers, Right, so there's the clash of the um, manifest and the scientific yeah, images. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And, you know, the cognitive sciences are particularly interesting because the scientist is taking herself as object. Um, uh, and so in an interesting way, the clash is particularly acute uh, when it comes to the cognitive sciences. And so linguistics would be a case in point. Um, so, so I don't know, it doesn't seem to me maybe daft, I think is the word you used, <laughs> but, oh. but uh, uh, I, I don't know exactly what the thought was there. So I guess it's just an, imp, uh, an invitation to, to say a bit more. Maybe. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I, I, sometimes, um, I sometimes find myself saying rude things without, <laughs> without feeling rude, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, <clears throat> the, the, the thing which Gal uh, Galileo, the thing which Husserl stresses, which is what I was suggesting was kind of daft in a way, was um, a kind of error, if you like, on um, on um, um, Galileo's part, where saying he uh, relies upon a geometry, right, the language of circles and squares and so on and so forth. Uh, when these very notions um, are only available to him via um, you know, some kind of perception or some kind of perceptual uh, intuition. Uh, and my point, I shouldn't, I think I said it was silly, I'm daft or something. And my point really there was uh, that doesn't really make much difference precisely because <clears throat> what you then quickly found with the development of analytical geometry and calculus was precisely the kind of shedding of um, that kind of perceptual intuition within kind of geometry or mathematics. Do you see what I mean? But, but, you, but you're, you're, you're absolutely, so in a sense, even if Galileo was guilty of that, it doesn't really affect the kind of Galilean kind of style. <clears throat> I think you're right though, in saying um, what Husserl is really concerned with is precisely something like Seller's kind of distinction. No. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't know if Georges is, is still there, but I'm always arguing with Georges about this because Georges is always like accusing me of being some kind of closet, kind of Salazian or something like this one. Whereas Georges, Georges is more kind of hard nosed in some respects. Um, <clears throat> whereas for me, I have no problem with a kind of Lebenswelt, let's call it. So I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to do away with that. Um, I, I'm very much of a kind of Kantian in, in many respects. Um, I, I just think, at least in the context of what I was talking about today, um, that that's a kind of interaction um, kind of phenomenon, right? So um, that doesn't preclude us from having uh, something more like a kind of Galilean approach to a whole range of to a whole range of phenomena. Uh, oh, I suppose in familiar terms, there's a kind of personal or subpersonal distinction. And then we're thinking to think of the uh, the, the uh, personal level, as it were, the think of a personal level as some sort of complex interaction effect, which involves these subpersonal systems. So I suppose that would be my way out of the um, 
oh, one way of thinking of what Hassel described as a crisis. <laughs> mm-hmm. if, that, if that kind of makes sense, it helps. No, good, good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That, that is helpful. I'll actually, in my talk, be saying a bit more about the Lebensvelt and that sort of thing. So. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Right. Julie? Uh, thank you. That, that was very interesting. Um, I am a linguist, so my, my question will probably reflect that. Uh, and I am not a syntactician, so I'm pretty happy to see how chunks cannot be too, very right. Uh, but I'm wondering, like, living chop, what, what he says uh, and what he was talking about aside. I'm, I was wondering whether other work on linguistics does follow the Galilean style. What I'm thinking, particularly in semantics, what people do with, uh, let's say, with rational speech act theories, that they model an, an um, ideal listener and ideal hearer, and then they derive particular phenomena based on the reasoning of the ideal listener and ide- ideal Bayesian reasoning of the ideal listener and ideal speaker on each other's reasoning. Mm-hmm. So whether those kind of models in well, would be a good example of a Galilean thinking in, uh, uh, in generative grammar or oh, not about generative grammar in a big sense, in a generative linguistics. And a second a kind of yeah. small point, and, and again, that probably again due to due to Chomsky, mm. you, you were saying that prosodic, then you were ta- then you were describing yeah. Fodor's um, um, yeah. solution. You're saying that prosody is not part of uh, competence, if I understood it correctly. Yeah, well, but, <clears> at, <throat> least, at least syntax. Well, yeah, okay, yeah, good. So if, if we think about pro, then if we think about prosody as part of competence and having the same uh, idealized rules as syntax would have and including recursive rules, that would be, that, that would, uh, would that change something? I should phrase it as questions. Yeah, okay. Um, so thank you, uh, interesting questions. Um, so the first, point um <clears throat> yes i mean so if you recall i was making a distinction if you like between um um what your so like what the target is of the theory so with um the generative idea of syntax or at least if, if one follows uh chomsky the ones concerned with like internal states you're not concerned with a kind of idealized kind of performance kind of system. And uh, it seems to me with um, some of the kind of views you mentioned, or at least kind of tilted towards, uh, it's unclear to me whether um, they are, as well, concerned with a kind of idealized performance or whether they're concerned with a, with a kind of internal state that's abstracted away from its interaction with other kinds of phenomena. So, um, you know, if you take, say, someone like, say, in some of Grice's kind of later work, Grice says, you know, sure, this isn't a model for a speaker here, because in, in principle, it's, it's indefinitely extendable. You know, I, you know, I recognize that you recognize that I recognize, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and all that. Um, whereas w- w- with that, it's then unclear uh, where the kind of, um, how the explanation works. Do you see what I mean? I mean, it's, it's, so you're, you're being given a kind of description, a kind of idealized description of a certain kind of, in principle kind of performance, but then it's all clear then how you uh, get back to the phenomena, if you see what I mean. So, so on the Galilean style as I presented it, you kind of decompose mm-hmm. complex phenomena into certain identifiable parts and then see how to get 
back by how these parts interact with one another. Whereas on, on a number of kind of idealized views, it's then unclear how you get back to the actual phenomena. Does that yeah, make right. sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. It's, uh, it, it explains it, yeah. Yeah, and um, the you. second, yeah, the second, the second, oh yeah, um, on kind of prosody, um, I, so I, I take it, it's not so much, um, so the, the point uh, John Froda makes there is that however you think of prosody, you know, I mean, so in any kind of scientific pursuits, I suppose there's always going to be some level of kind of abstraction and idealization. Right? But however you're thinking of prosody, it's a different kind of system. So even if one thought of it as competence, it's a different kind of competence you would have from, say, the competence concerned with um, uh, syntax, <clears throat> precisely because uh, prosody isn't. Um, isn't compositional or, or, or recursive. So uh, whereas you were saying, well, if it were, um, then yeah, I mean, I suppose you could imagine a system, you know, a certain cognitive design where the two things did kind of match in step. Is, is that a sort of thing you had in mind? Well, I, I was probably my kind of first uh, reaction to that was if we are not concerned only with syntax, but think about um, the, the linguistics, generative linguistics, where prosody is part of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But that, yeah. That, that, that was kind of my Oh, I see. yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. I was just, I, I was supposed to be just assuming that they're, they're two different kinds of <clears throat> systems. It, it, so, um, you know, if you want to account for the uh, complex phenomena, then you're going to have to make various divisions between syntax and semantics and prosody. And then because you make these divisions, once you then as well put these things back together again, then you're going to have these misalignments. And that's, I suppose, kind of <coughs> Jana Foda's basic kind of idea, that the, the, the center embedding is just like a kind of accidental kind of misalignment that you don't notice <laughs> because um uh you know you you just don't use the uh, syntax in ways that are gonna fall outside of of the constraints from from a prosody you know but but sometimes you can but then if if you do you're more likely to fall into um you know kind of what looks like word salad but then you can realize well actually i can arrange the prosody in such a way that I can interpret these structures. It is just very, very hard to do and you wouldn't, you know, it's, it's like in a normal run of speech, <clears throat> you don't make sure that each sentence is chunked into three balanced parts, you know, that's the idea. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, my, my, uh, again, that's that's probably um, my concern. Thinking that, uh, well, Chomsky thinks that um, syntax is the queen, the king, or whatever the monarch of linguistics. Then, uh, if we if we add all other components into the system and think about the system as the complex system, and this is our competence, then ah, okay. that, that yeah. changes the picture. Yeah. So that would be. Are you thinking of something like something like, let's say, Jack and Dorf kind of proposed? You know, so, so in other words, we we need to get rid of a kind of syntaxocentrism and think of these as different systems working in in concert with each other. Is that the? Well, I was not thinking about exactly him, but that's. Yeah. I, I think that that's that's what people nowadays assume that we all work in linguistics you know, on our corners. And once we yeah. put that, all those things together, we will account for, for more, data, more data because some of them come from the restrictions on interactions in, and interfaces. Yeah, no, okay. Oh, yeah. No, well, yeah, yeah in, in that respect, then, I would, I would absolutely endorse that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like it turns out that a lot of, a lot of phenomena 
are, are going to be as a record of interaction effects rather than due to this system or that system. Yeah. And then what, that would also be part of the competence. Yeah, yes. So I suppose you could say, yes, that's right. So uh, I suppose back in the 60s, competence referred to something fairly narrow, like sort of syntax, but I would be perfectly happy to have a kind of broader idea of competence, if by that one means, as well, it still doesn't count as mere performance, you know? Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you. Great. Yeah, yeah. I Thanks see. Thank you. Yeah. We still have a few minutes left. So if any of you has a question for John, feel free to raise your hand. In the meantime, uh, I would like to ask you a question about the crucial difference. So the Chomskyan approach is internalist and, and Galileo's view, according to what you explained, was not internalist with respect to physical systems. And I was wondering whether this difference does that um, undermine the very idea that there is a Galilean style in, in general <laughs> linguistics. Uh, obviously, your answer to that is going to be negative, but I would like you to elaborate a bit on that. Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose I would just... Um, um, let me think. Well, I, I, I didn't have enough time and, uh, to really say, consider the kind of objection you would have, say, from Jerry Fodor or Zeman Polition or Georges um, um, on this. But it seems to me um, uh, a way of construing the kind of objection I had in mind. Um, from Fodor, Polish, and, and Georges would be the way you kind of articulated it, which would be a kind of saying, look, and if you want to be properly Galilean here, what you really need to do is to be thinking more in terms of some kind of mechanisms that actually realise this stuff. You're, you're far too abstract. So it, in the quote, I, I uh, had from Galileo where he says, look, you know, what I'm doing, what I'm suggesting is that you ignore the packing, as it were, that the, the straw comes in and the sugar comes in, right? That's, that's a good accountant, you ignore that. In the same way as a physicist is going to ignore lots of kind of accidental phenomena. But what you are trying to capture is something nevertheless perfectly real. And I, this relates, I suppose, to the old issue of something like psychological reality. You know, so look, if you're if you wanting to go Galilean on the inside, you, you, you'd better be talking about something as well, uh, real rather than merely abstract. Um, I suppose what I was wanting to go for, which is something I kind of buy anyway is the idea of, look, there are certain kinds of styles of explanation that just go with a certain kind of theory. <clears throat> and um, what look like um, kind of metaphysical entailments of these theories are just really kind of projections from that style of theory. So it's like, uh, it just turns out that you're going to need something like a computational theory in order to account for, you know, some syntactic, semantic competence. Uh, just simply because no other theory will do. <laughs> I mean, uh, and that's then going to say, okay, so this is a kind of theory I have. What I need is something that's, you know, finitely specifiable, that's, that can generate infinitely many kind of structures. That process of generation imposes a certain form or such a uniform form of structure and that's it um so i so i think the appeal to something more kind of real as it were uh like you need physical symbols you need mechanical local transitions between symbols i think that's just kind of metaphysics that that doesn't really follow from the theory 
Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I would need a lot more time to go through the particulars here, but, but that would be my sort of general uh, kind of response. Um, what, what looks like from these people like um, serious kind of naturalistic obligations that come with positing a computational theory. Um, for me, actually, they're just more like kind of metaphysics rather than things that genuinely follow from the theory. Um, but I, I can, I can, I can defend that here. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, John. Um, if there are no more questions, then we can thank our speaker again. Uh, um, thank you, John. We can use the button. I think there's a button for clap. <laughs> That's great. So we will um, have the first break of this uh, session. We will be back in 20 minutes. Right.